for that part of the country was was really, really large. I guess it would accommodate two or three hundred people, and churches up in the upper Midwest just, just are not typically of that size. And while I was there that week, some of the members shared with me that in years gone by for gospel meetings, they had literally filled that place up to overflowing. I mean, two or three hundred people, chairs in the aisles, all that kind of thing. Of course, the week that I was there, we didn't have a crowd like that. Uh, in fact, just the opposite. We had about 15 or 20 people who all sat right down in about two pews on the left side. And, and maybe you're thinking, perhaps that was somehow related to who was speaking that week, and maybe so. But the truth is that this group was not what it had once been. That's about all that was left of them, about 20 people. I got there early one evening. And this group had a, uh, a rather large classroom wing in addition to their big auditorium. And so I was the only one there other than the guy that had opened the door. And so I kind of nosed around in their classrooms a little bit. I, I tend to do that. And uh, went and peeked in the rooms down this long hallway. And I guess in the past those rooms had been used for children's Bible classes. But as I looked in the rooms, there was no sign of any Bible teaching going on. The truth is they were just dusty old storage closets where over the years stuff that wasn't being used anymore had been stacked, old chairs and tables and things like that. You see, they weren't using the rooms anymore because there weren't any children. That little group that gathered on those first two seats down front on the left side were mostly older people. It was a graying crowd and there were no children in the congregation there anymore. You see, what had happened? is over the years, this once thriving congregation had experienced a terrible decline. And they went from this huge group now to just this little handful of mostly older people just trying to keep the doors open. And while I don't want to be a pessimist, my guess is, brothers and sisters, that they eventually will be unsuccessful. They're not going to be able to do that. And that that group is going to go the way of a lot of groups. Eventually, eventually it's going to die. That's a sad story, isn't it? I think what all of us need to appreciate is that it is not an unusual story. In fact, if we just had to be honest about this, it's, it's happening. Stories like that are happening literally all across America. I see it in my little circle of experience. I probably visit a half dozen to a dozen different congregations over the course of a year, sometimes when I'm on vacation or to do special events like this. And I will tell you that occasionally I stumble across a group that seems to be doing well, that's thriving and growing, and, and people are excited and there's energy there. Occasionally I find that. But that is certainly not the norm. That is sort of the exception. Sometimes I, I visit a church and, and it seems like they're kind of maintaining. They're, they're, they're this year about where they were two years ago and five years ago, seeming to kind of, to kind of hold their own. But, but the truth is, most of the time, most churches that I have a chance to visit and, and be part of, if I know anything about their history at all, what I know is, is that they're declining. And, and what I mean by that is, if you could go back 20 or 30 years and look at their numbers, gradually they're just going down and down and down. And sometimes when I say that, people kind of protest, and they say, well, David, it isn't all about the numbers. But I'm going to tell you, brothers and sisters, at some point it becomes about the numbers. Because you run out of people. You can't keep the doors open anymore. That's how churches die. Those who study this on a more formal basis tell us that it is epidemic among our brethren, that this is what is happening to most churches. They are in a state of decline. What I want to talk about for a little bit this morning is why that happens. Why is this going on and why is it happening all over the country? And maybe you're sitting there thinking, wow, so I got that extra hour of sleep and I came in to worship with God's people and hear something from God's word and you share this bright way of sunshine with us this morning. Churches all over the country are declining. What an upbeat, uplifting message. But I will tell you, this is not my intent this morning at all to be negative about this. I would just submit that I don't think we can afford to be naive and be like the ostrich who buries his head in the sand and doesn't pay attention to everything else that's going on around us. Folks, this is happening. 
And I think what we need to do is be wise and to ask the question, why? To the end, and I want you to pay attention to this part down here on the bottom in red, right down here. I think we need to talk about that so we can avoid following that same terrible path. That on our watch, while we are here working with the groups that we're working with, that we could take positive, proactive steps to be sure that doesn't happen on our watch. That we're be, we make sure we're doing the kinds of things that will continually to, continue to help our church families grow and thrive. So you see where we're going with this? I'm going to dabble a little bit in the negative this morning, but only so that we can get to the positive and talk about how churches grow and thrive and avoid the fate of so many others. So that's where I'm headed this morning. I want to give you three reasons that I believe churches are declining. And we'll put those on the table so that we can know what we do on our watch and with our efforts and energies to make sure that doesn't happen where we are. So let's begin with this. Why do churches decline? Number one, they decline because they do not teach the laws. Can I just tell you that I'm putting that on the list first because I think it belongs on the list first. This is the problem. It is the fundamental problem, the most important problem. Churches decline because they're not reaching lost people. I just need to be crystal clear about this. If we are not out in our community making connections with people who don't know Jesus and trying to shine as a light, stir up conversations about spiritual things, invite those folks to come and visit or to come to our house and have a personal Bible study over the kitchen table and eventually leading some of those people to know Christ and respond to the gospel and become New Testament Christians and to be added to our family. Doing that work, then we're on the countdown clock. Eventually, we will decline. Now, sometimes we don't believe that because things happen that help us avoid facing this reality. Let me illustrate what I mean by that. Sometimes church families find themselves right in the middle of a part of the country where the economy is thriving. I work with a church in Southeast Texas. It is not the garden spot of the United States. It's not, certainly not as pretty as this little area of South Carolina. But folks, we make gasoline. So I just like to tell you this. When oil prices are up, we kill the fatted calf and begin to celebrate. That is very good for Southeast Texas. And our economy booms. And I can tell you what happens. As the oil industry fire, fires up and those refineries get busy, they hire people. And folks from all over the country well, they're forced to move to Southeast Texas for jobs, right? Sometimes churches find themselves in a spot like that, where for some reason, maybe for economic reasons, people want to move there. There are jobs there. And in that crowd of people, inevitably, there are Christians who come and who bring their families and who join our ranks and become part of our team. And if you find yourself in a, in a spot like that, what happens is your numbers begin to go up, right? You're adding people, the attendance board, those numbers tick up. And some of those people bring children with them, and those children filter into our Bible class programs, and those programs start thriving. You know, more people you get in there, and excited families, more work gets pumped into that. And so you got all these kids, sometimes class, ever have a class like with 32-year-olds? Yeah, you ladies think there's bad when they're two. Try when they're 17, you got 30 in the teenage class. And so the classes are thriving and doing well. And you start piling all those people in your auditorium. And when they start singing, it raises the roof. And the worship is just awesome and passionate. And we go out the sun door Sunday feeling really good about that, saying things like, this church is really growing, right? Do you realize that we can say that kind of thing? And those kind of things can be going on while the fundamental mission of God's people is being neglected. Jesus said in Luke 19 and verse 10 that he came to seek and save 
the lost. And then, and then at, at, at the end of three of the four Gospels, he asked us to partner with him in that mission. Matthew 28 and verse 18, Jesus said, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all the nations. Early disciples got that. And Acts 8 and verse 4, even after they, they're killing people for talking about Jesus, those who were scattered after Stephen's death, Acts 8 and verse 4 says, they went everywhere preaching the word. That idea, interestingly enough, that idea is even buried in Old Testament prophecy. In, in Isaiah chapter 9, the prophet talked about how when the days of the Messiah would come, people would go and spread that message among the nations. The idea that this great truth about Jesus, the Savior, was going to be told everywhere is even foretold in the Old Testament prophets. And what I'm saying to you is that we can have this feeling that we're growing and thriving while all along... That mission is not being done. Here's the problem. Churches that live by the economy will also die by the economy. Because I promise to you folks, economic prosperity comes in waves. I'm saying y'all been living long enough to see that. Boy, in the 80s, the oil industry plummeted. Gas prices fell. That is not, I know y'all like that at the pump. We do not like that in Southeast Texas. Those refineries start, well, they start winding down. Production goes down. Things like that happen. You know what happens to all those people who move to our part of the country when the refineries aren't all fired up? They move somewhere else to find work. Church where I'm preaching back in the 80s lost 100 people over a period of about four or five years. And so all those people that came for jobs, when the economy changes, they go somewhere else looking for jobs. And if our, if our growth is not conversion-based, if we're not reaching the people in our community, what happens? Well, the numbers start going down. And the Bible classes start emptying. Now, rather than breaking out new classes, we're combining classes because there's so few children. And the auditorium that was once filled now has just a scattering people. And the worship isn't nearly as passionate and excited. And the church begins to decline. Churches that live by the economy will die by the economy. We may be able to dodge this reality for a little while, but brothers and sisters, we are on the countdown clock. Conversion-based growth is the lifeblood of the church. That's what we see in Acts 2. At the end of the chapter, after that great celebration in Acts chapter 2, all those people respond. It says the Lord was adding to their number day by day all of the people who had been transferred to Jerusalem. That's not right, is it? The Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. Do you see it? And so what's the lesson? What's the takeaway for me and you? Knowing that churches decline because they do not teach the laws, brothers and sisters, we need to get really serious about the work of spreading the gospel. There's the positive lesson. There's the takeaway for me and you. We need to get stirred up and passionate about reaching lost people. I heard a guy say one time that he wished that would become the next big issue in the church. Are some of you around that, that remember the battle over institutionalism? I was a little kid growing up at a church where Roy Cogdell at one time was our preacher. And you guys think sermons are long today? Roy Cogdell would talk for 30 minutes and then say, let me get to my lesson. And all the 11-year-olds like me went, ha. Oh. I tell you what, a month of Sundays didn't pass without a lesson about Bible authority and institutionalism because that was a big issue. And what I'm suggesting to you is I wish that, that this work would become a big issue among us. Like, like a month of Sundays wouldn't go by without someone saying something to remind us. We need to be out reaching lost people and having classes that train us and equip us to go out and reach lost people and special events all focused around stirring our passion for reaching lost people and church family conversation all the time going on about who we're trying to reach at work or the neighbor we persuaded to sit down and have a Bible study with us or the guests that we invited and they came this morning. I think we need to be all about doing that work. And I want to be crystal clear about something. I think there are a few things that church families can do together 
to encourage evangelism. There's some things we can do as a church family to try to reach our community, invite folks to come and, and to visit and investigate. But brothers and sisters, primarily evangelism is an individual work. Can I be clear about that? Evangelism is first and foremost about me and you wandering out into this circle of people that we know who are lost and need Jesus and shining as a light and trying to look for opportunities to start a conversation about spiritual things and try to set up personal Bible studies with people, invite people to come and visit services. Let me, let me can I brag on y'all for a minute? I mean, from the moment we walked into this church meeting on Friday night, my wife and I have both been talking about how warm and friendly and kind this group of people is. And I'm guessing you didn't just do that to us because we're visiting preaching, right? That's the way you are with guests all the time. That's my, what, what I believe about you. What a great place to invite people to come to and receive that kind of greeting, searching people who are trying to find what's missing in their life. You and I as individuals need to be out doing that work all the time. It's primarily about what we do individually. Reaching lost people is an individual work. If churches are gonna thrive that way, I've gotta be doing my part in this. Because if we do not, then we're on the countdown clock. Decline is coming, and we're going to die. So we have to be busy all the time about reaching lost people. We need to be stirred up about that again, brothers and sisters. I'm going to stop talking about that because I'm going to say some more about that in the lesson that will follow in the next hour. I want to move on to a second thing. A second reason that churches are declining is because they lose their children. I put that on the list because it seems like every time I visit a church that is in a state of decline, at some point along the way, somebody will make this statement. I bet you've heard someone say it before. They will say, you know, if we just had half of the kids that grew up here, this building would be full. Have you ever heard somebody say that? When I hear that, the thing that goes on in my brain is this. Well, where did they go? Where are the kids that grew up here? And I suppose there's some different ways to answer that question. When our kids hit about 18 back in Beaumont where I preach and graduate from high school, they do this, this terrible thing that I hate. The next fall they leave. Do your kids do that? Our kids, a lot of them pack up and, and go over to College Station where they, they go to school at Texas A&M. And I will tell you, we've just decided if they get any more kids, we're going to put a trade embargo against them until they start sending some back. Our kids pack up and go off to school. And candidly, some of them leave and don't come back. Our girls meet boys over there and fall in love and get married. And those boys take them to other parts of the country and we don't get them anymore. That happens to some of them. Some of them find jobs in other places and that takes them off to a different city. But you and I both know right now, we're dabbling on the fringes, right? When we talk about losing kids, we're not talking about kids moving off to go to school or going to another city to find a job. The vast majority of the kids we don't see in the seats anymore grew up, left home. And they left Jesus. And that's why they're not there. I don't know what the current numbers are. I used to keep up with this 10 years ago or so. Uh, frankly, the news was never good, so I stopped paying attention. But the numbers are somewhere north of half, 50, 60, 70 percent. And the denominational world is far worse than that. Denominations are losing, I've seen numbers as high as 75, 80, or 90% of their kids. So just as an aside, may I point out, when you look at the big church up the road that has the youth group with 200 kids and all those exciting things going on with the kids, the big Halloween celebrations and the youth trips and all that kind of stuff, may I just point out to you that in a 10-year window, Seven or eight out of ten of those kids are not going to be serving God. We don't know how to, or, or, or involved in religion in any way. 
So we don't take our cue from the church up the street to figure out what to do with their ki our kids. They're not doing better. They're doing worse than we are. But folks, we're losing a lot of our kids. So put all that together. There is no positive growth taking place. A church isn't reaching anybody from the community. I moved to work with a church one time and the elders told me they could not remember anyone that had been converted from the community in a decade. Ten years. And then add to that, kids are growing up and most of them are falling away. And do you see? Do you see decline? you see the problem? So, enough of the negative. What do we do about that? Well... I would just submit to you that we need to make really sure that we take care of our kids. I think, I think that needs to be one of our highest priorities is making sure we take care of our kids. I said in the class, I think I said this yesterday. I've slept in since then, so I don't really remember. But our kids are our most at-risk group. Do you realize that? Let me tell you something. If you are over the age of 60, you could celebrate because the chance of you deciding to turn away from Jesus at some point in the future, I mean, it almost doesn't exist. People who are still serving God at 60, I mean, almost all of them keep on serving God. We don't lose many people in the auditorium class, okay? In fact, if you back that up 30 years, if you are 30 and you are still serving God, the risk is a little bit higher, but not substantially. People who get into their 30s and 40s and they are still walking with Jesus, almost all of them keep walking with Jesus. So if, if that's where you're at, if you're over the age of 30, you've got a pretty good shot at making it all the way to the end. But now people under the age of 30, you start looking at that number, 60, 70% of them at some point in the next 10 year window will decide that they don't want to serve God. I think that needs to be a big deal to us. I think that should, should heighten our concern and make our kids a number one priority. We're more likely to lose them along the way more so than anybody else. And so I think we need to make sure that we take care of our kids. There's some things we can do about that as a church family. I think kids need Rock solid Bible classes. My coworker and I, when we worked on Bible classes in the past, we had this tension between us because he was all about putting a great teacher in the auditorium class because that's where visitors came and said, he said, listen, we need top notch teaching all the time in our auditorium class. I said, that's all fine and good, but whether the teaching's good or bad, the auditorium, those folks are going to hang in there, right? We need top-notch teaching in our high school class. Those are the kids we're going to lose. In our junior high class, those are the kids we're going to lose. So I tell you, when I plan Bible classes, I begin by thinking about high school and junior high. Who is going to be working with our children? And listen, those need to be rock-solid Bible classes where kids are learning these fundamental foundation stones of their faith that will help keep them strong with the storms that are coming for them as they start trying to make their way through school and college and those things and maintain their faith in God. We need rock solid Bible classes. The second thing we need to do is we need to equip our kids to serve in the kingdom of God. Peter said in 1 Peter 4 verse 10 that everybody has a, uh, received a special gift and that we are to employ it as good stewards of God's grace. So I want you to think about that in terms of your kids. Young people growing up here have skills and abilities that have kingdom application. What are they? Well, a lot of churches don't pay attention to their kids until they're like 17 or 18 years old. See the problem with that? You wait till they're 17 or 18, they're getting ready to leave. And so we've adopted a motto with our kids back where I preach. Three words. Our motto with our kids is equipped to serve. We want our kids, by the time they hit 18 and they're ready to go over to that church and college station, we want them to be equipped to serve. We want them to have found whatever their gifts are. And we want to give them an opportunity to, to hone and develop that gifts. And so we have training classes for our young men who have some ability to lead singing or to speak or teach and an and, and application for, for public worship. And we've got stuff that ladies do with our young girls to get them involved in caring for the elderly and for sick people and folks who are in need. And we find ways to work even our teenage kids into Bible class teaching rotations. So if they've got skills in that, they learn a little bit. 
about how to work. We want to get them plugged in to God's work so that when they leave us and they go over to that church and college station, they don't just sit on the back pew somewhere. But they've already got a gift. If they're a song leader, they can already get up and lead singing. Or if they can teach class, they've already had experience teaching Bible class. They can get plugged into the work of God. One of those lines that tethers our kids to God and his people is finding their niche and their place to serve in his kingdom. i got to watch the clock, Ben, because I could just go on and on and on about this. All kinds of other things church families can do. You can have devos for the kids and have special events. We do an event every summer just for our kids. One Sunday night a month, we have kids night sermon where we get the kids down front and preach a lesson just for them and on and on and on. We try to make a big deal about our kids because I think taking care of them needs to be one of our highest priorities. But now, I need to come back and say that although there are some things church families can do to take care of kids, you guys know that this battle is not one. I usually say within the four walls of this building. I don't know how many walls are in this auditorium, but that doesn't work. (laughs) The battle for our kids is not going to be won in this church building, right? So I want to point you to the book of Deuteronomy. I love this passage. This is some good refrigerator door wisdom for parents. Back in Deuteronomy 6. You know, the first part of chapter 6, it's clear that Moses is concerned about future generations serving the Lord. Let me just begin at verse 1. Now, this is the commandment, the statutes, and the judgments which the Lord your God has commanded me to teach you that you might do them in the land where you are going over to possess it. Listen to verse 2. He says, so that you and your son and your grandson might fear the Lord your God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments. Do you see his concern with future generations? You and your son and your grandson. Moses, in this farewell address to the people, is concerned about future generations being faithful. Why not? He knows how rebellious and difficult these people have been. So he is worried about this future generation continuing to serve God. So how is that going to happen? What should they be doing to be sure their kids are faithful? Let's pick up in verse 4. He says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. These words which I am commanding you today shall be on your heart. Look at verse 7. He said, You shall teach them diligently to your sons And shall talk of them when you sit in your house and when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand and they shall be as frontals on your forehead. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and of your gates. So when the Holy Spirit through Moses talks to Israel about the faithfulness of future generations, I want you to notice how with laser-like focus, He looks at the home. He's not talking about what the priest ought to be doing or what ought to happen at the tabernacle. He talks about what ought to happen at your house. And isn't it interesting that he chooses to focus on just sort of daily conversations about this covenant that they have with God. He said, listen, when you're just hanging around the house, talk about that. And when you're out going somewhere, we would say, riding along in the car, talk about this. And when you get up in the morning, talk about this. And when you're going to bed at night, talk about this. Keep this in front of your kids all the time. In the New Covenant, the Holy Spirit by Paul would say, bring up your children in the discipline and instruction of the Lord. So listen, this is about mom and dad. This is about what we do at home with our kids networking them with the word of God all the time, bringing it to bear in everything that's going on in their lives. And there are so many things that distract us from that. From the rush of all the activities at school to the devices and television and all those things that keep our attention occupied with other things. Folks, we just got to rise above that. We've got to do different than everything else going on in the world. Because I just point out, if you're average and you do about what everybody else is doing, what all the other parents are doing, you're going to lose half your kids or more. 
because that's what's happening. So I would just submit this, the status quo is not good enough. Can I say that again? Doing about what everyone else is doing is not good enough because that means we lose half our kids or more. We've got to do better. And it begins at home. Because I will tell you, if we don't take care of our kids, not only does that impact them spiritually, eternally, but as we lose our kids, churches begin to dwindle and die. Have to take care of our kids. All right. What, about 10 minutes, 9 minutes? I better get on my next point, right? Okay. I've ranted long enough. Last reason churches decline and die is because they fight and divide. I add that to the list because it seems to me that that is sort of a connecting thread between declining churches. That if you start digging around a little bit, inevitably you'll find that, that, that folks who are in declining churches seem to have problems getting along with each other. Here's the thing that I think is interesting about those problems. They are almost never over big, important doctrinal issues. They are not battles over truth and error. I'll just be honest with you. I never see troubled churches battling over great issues of truth and error, over, over false teaching and trying to protect the flock. I don't ever see that kind of thing going on. What I see typically is churches that fight over things that don't matter. Can I illustrate that with the worst example I've ever seen? I was conducting a meeting like this for a church and the preacher was telling me about a big explosion that had happened a couple of years before in this, in this church family. They had had a huge, huge issue over the issue of ceiling fans. I'm not making this up. I guess y'all don't have to wrestle with that. They had a huge blow up in this church over ceiling fans. Now, you may be thinking, yeah, there's got to be more to that. that that's, that's my gut about that, too, that there had probably been some disgruntledness over other stuff, uh, that, that, that this just was the, 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 the issue that kind of blew things up. That may have been true, but that's what it was. It was over ceiling fans. And I think, that, folks, that's the kind of thing I see. Churches fussing over stuff that doesn't matter. But sometimes it's worse than that. Not only are they, are they fussing with each other, but sometimes those fusses become fracture lines that literally tear brethren apart. This ceiling fan issue, it wasn't just a disruption in that church. The church divided over that. And there are two groups that formed based on that. And what, what, what actually initiated the whole conversation, I'm in this little bitty East Texas town, and there are three churches. And I'm having lunch with the preacher. I said, I'm just curious. Little bitty town, Three churches. Wouldn't it be good for y'all all to be together? And that's how I learned about the ceiling fans. I really wanted to visit the other building and see if they had ceiling fans. I just wondered about them. We need to appreciate that churches cannot thrive in that kind of acrimony. Now, I need to talk plainly about that because I think sometimes we're not plain enough. Folks, this kind of, of, of silly squabbling, let's call it what it is, it's wicked. Amen. It's evil. Contrary to God's will for us. And on how many levels? In John 13, 34 and 35, Jesus talks about the love that we're supposed to have with each other. It's certainly not consistent with that. In John 17, he prayed that we would all be one as, as he and the Father are one. And it works contrary to that. And listen, going back to that first point we made about reaching the lost, it will, it will hamper, if not bring to a screeching halt, all of the efforts to reach lost people. If we're fussing and fighting with each other, there's no, there's no energy left to go out and try to reach lost people. And don't even talk about working together. If brethren are busy going to battle over ceiling fans, you're not going to pair them up and put them in a children's class and teach together. Sometimes they won't even speak to each other. They'll sit on opposite sides of the buildings and stew and be angry for, for decades. So let's call that what it is. It's wicked. It is sinful. And we need to say that because brothers and sisters, men and women will, will stand before God for this silly fussing and 
bickering that divides his people and hampers his work. And so, I heard a bell, so I better hurry. What's the positive side, the response to that? Just that we need to work really hard to get along with each other. I say that because if you go over to the book of Ephesians, that is exactly what Paul tells us to do. I'm thinking about Ephesians 4. As he turns to the practical side of this letter, he's described the wonderful things that God has done for us in Christ Jesus. And then as he turns his attention to how that should impact us in our living, this is Ephesians 4 and verse 1. He says, Therefore I, the prisoner of the Lord, implore you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling with which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent, verse three says, to preserve the unity of the spirit in the bond of peace. So I am not a Greek scholar, not even close. And I don't pretend to be one on Sundays. But I did read some about what the scholars say about this language in verse three being diligent to preserve the unity of the spirit. And the language there carries this idea of hard work on an ongoing basis. And I think both of those pieces are important. Unity is not this thing that we achieve and then put on the shelf and say, we've got that squared away, let's go work on something else. So we've got to work hard all the time to get along with each other. That will be, brothers and sisters, an ongoing struggle in every church family. And we have to work hard at it. It takes diligent effort to pull together, be a family, and do the work that God wants us to do. Part of the reason I think that's so is because churches are such a bizarre collection of people. Have you ever thought about that? I mean, we are really a strange group, divided Racially, and economically, we come from all kinds of different backgrounds and experiences. I mean, in our church, we've got Southerners like me and Yankees like my wife, people who like country music like me and people who like opera like my wife. It's amazing we get along with each other. And I will just tell you something. Sometimes we don't. I mean, there's nobody left in my house but me and my wife. And I will just honestly admit to you, sometimes we fuss. We have to work diligently in our family to preserve the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace. And so you throw together all these different people and a church family like this, we've got to work really hard to get along with each other. But I would remind you, we do that, brothers and sisters, because we are doing the most important work on the planet together. I think that's one of the things I need to consider. Is my little fuss about ceiling fans or whatever really worth occupying the attention and energy of our church family as we try to rescue lost people from hell? Is my little fuss really worth it? Sometimes, sometimes we just need to get over it and move on. And just to decide, it really isn't that important. In fact, looking back in Ephesians 4, some of the language in verse 2 carries the idea carries the idea of putting up with each other. Some translations in that last part of the verse actually say, put up with each other. And we have to do that. You ever been in a church family with somebody that just kind of rubs you the wrong way and gets on your nerves? Someone says, well, I haven't found anyone like, here, uh, like that here. Uh, give it some time. He's here. You just haven't found him. You know, sometimes it's just that way. Our personalities clash and we struggle to get along and we just have to put up with each other. That's the idea. Because the work we have to do together is just that important. And so I want you to pay attention to verse 2. I think verse 2 is important because it gives us the character necessary to be unified. Sometimes I think our divisions and our fussing are really more about spiritual immaturity than they are the issues involved. We're not humble. We want to have our way about everything. We're not gentle. We don't treat each other kindly. We're not patient with each other's faults and weaknesses. The character described in verse 2, the mature character we put on in Christ, is the key to pulling God's people together. That was my last bell, right? Need to stop. So here's what I want to say about that. That all becomes important, brothers and sisters, because if we're not reaching lost people and we're losing our kids and then we start fussing with each other, we're going to die need to work really hard 
to get along. Thank you so much for your attention.